Wonderful to hear everybody, uh, the, the chatter ongoing, because what it means is, uh, you know, we have a wonderful congregation that gets along really well with one another. I try to make as many, uh, you know, of the new guests feel as comfortable as possible. Um, we're going to now resume the Ask the Pastor, part, uh, part B, I guess, of 2014. Um, we've got, we decided to go ahead and do this again because it was so well received uh, last week. So we're ready to start with the test questions. Almost. Almost? Almost. But first, I'd just like to really thank Mike. What a great job he does. Doesn't he do a good job? I don't know that I do such a great job. I sit up here and ask questions, you know. <laughs> thank you. All right, you ready for the first question? Oh, yes. All right. This is one that's a really interesting question. Isn't Reformed theology a minority view in Christendom? Um, well, first, in, in uh, the spirit of full disclosure, this was a question I was asked just last week after the service. But I thought it was such a good question, and I'm sure others had it, that I, I wanted to address that issue. And those of you that know Parkside, that know me, uh, know that uh, we uh, follow the Reformation theology that really comes from Augustine, who got it from, from Paul, and uh, we're firmly committed to that. Uh, but the question is, isn't it a minority view? And I think I would have to say, uh, right now, it is, yes, in all of Christendom, it is a, a minority view. Now, it has not always been that way. There have been times when it was definitely the majority view, and it is now in the process of ascending. I, I believe it will continue to that place again. An example would be uh, the seminary that I went to, uh, right across the river over here in Portland. When I attended there, there was probably myself and maybe a small handful of others that were committed to the theology of the Reformers and of, of Paul and Augustine. Uh, if you were to go over there today, it would be just the opposite. It's flipped. And you may say, well, why is that? Well, in all of church history, if you begin with the first century and come to the 21st century, and I'm, I'm really going to simplify here, and this is a, a, a macro view for sure, that I have seen two really big cycles in theology. Uh, in the first century, the second century, the majority view uh, seemed to be the sovereignty of God, God was the decision maker, and so on and so forth. But as we come to the fourth century, the church starts rising, it starts gaining political power, it starts gaining civil power, and a slow drift over time, the focus of our salvation instead of being centered in God and His will, became centered in the church. So in other words, your salvation was in the church. And that began to, to grow and grow and grow until it became intolerable by the 13 and 1400s and people uh, started saying, this isn't right. And finally, uh, in the 1500s, this came to a head with Martin Luther in 1517, when he nailed his 95 theses on the door, uh, the church door there at Wittenberg, and began what we know as the Protestant Reformation. And the whole genesis of the Protestant Reformation was a, was a cry called ad fontes, which is simply Latin, and it means back to the originals. They said, no, it's not church dogma that drives what we believe, it's scripture that drives what we believe. And so from that point on, uh, this theology began to take over and became the majority view. And it produced, by the way, the greatest preachers of all time. Uh, you, you go back into church history, uh, you, you have Martin Luther, you have John Calvin, uh, you have John Knox, uh, you have uh, Charles Spurgeon, you, you have Jonathan Edwards, all of these guys, solid, reformed guys. Well, what happened? How did it go from there to the minority again? Well, once again, the locus of our salvation and what, where that was centered began to shift. And it began to shift this time not to the church, in evangelicalism anyway, but it began to shift to how do I feel? 
I'm going to have a personal relationship with Jesus. And, and we do have a personal relationship with Jesus, don't get me wrong. But what happened is people begin to personalize it to the way they felt, not to the way Jesus says it should be. And so as we begin to then make us the center of salvation, we drifted from those solid scriptural underpinnings. Until by the, the early 20th century, uh, you couldn't hardly find anybody that would actually raise their hand and stand up and said, say, yes, I believe uh, in the traditions of Calvin and Augustine and Paul. Uh, a few people would, but not many. Anyway, now we're seeing the same thing again. People are standing up. Popular pastors are standing up, and by that I mean the, the big name guys, not, not guys like me, but the ones that have a big audience are standing up and saying, you know what? The reformers were right. Scripture says what Scripture says, and we are to submit ourselves to what Scripture says rather than uh, force Scripture into what we think it should say. So, it still hasn't reached the place of the majority yet, but that's all right. I don't mind being in the minority as long as I'm there because I believe what Scripture says and take it at face value. That's that, I like that answer. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's uh, it, you know, everybody probably knows we we're studying a book written by a guy that you know is hard to read um, in the in the morning class, uh, the Sunday school class or the morning class for men, and, and uh, you know, it, it's been very difficult and uh, and nice to see that fourth century and start understanding some of what's going on. So it's you know at least it's uh, it's taking some effect on us. Okay, next question. Um, and, and this one kind of ties in with one of the questions we had last week because, you know, it was asked, uh, you know, in regards to, uh, uh, um, you know, free will and, and the fact that, you know, if you got free will, you can kind of do what you want and still be saved because, you know, you've got salvation. So this kind of ties to that and it says, uh, how does God continue to love us when we continue to sin and turn our backs on him? Okay. Uh, I think this question follows well over the question we just discussed because, Again, we have to ask, ask the question, are we going to take God at his word or are we going to take God's word and try to make it fit how we feel or how we think? Because what the genesis, I think, of this question is all of us blow it from time to time. Some of us blow it more often than others. Some of us blow it with the same stupid repeated thing over and over again. And so we begin to think, well, how can God continue to love me when I keep treating him this way? Because in our humanity, no matter how much we try to say we don't, we often base our love, our acceptance, our relationships on performance. God doesn't do that. When we look into his word, uh, early on in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3, he, he gives us a very succinct statement. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Well, how long is everlasting? Forever. Forever. Now, there's no caveats in there, is there? He doesn't say, I've loved you with an everlasting love unless you repeat the same stupid sin a hundred times. <laughs> no, it, it's a blanket statement. And then we, we move on up into the, the New Testament. There's just an abundance of scripture on this. In Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. Let me read that for you. Even as he, that's God, chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Okay, so now God chose us. Notice it doesn't say he chose us to be holy and blameless. He chose us to be holy and blameless before him. In his eyes, we are holy and blameless. In our eyes, eh, not so much. But it's his eyes that we're concerned with. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. So it's his will, based in love, that he chose us. Now this is based in God's love, which is unwavering, unchanging, forever. You know, John tells us in, in 1 John that God is love. 
And that's, a, of course, a true statement. But we read that statement, and we often, by the time we filter it through our brain, it comes out, love is God. And so we look at what we think would be perfect love, and we say, okay, that's what God is. But that's backwards. You see? God's love is perfect, and perfect love casts out all fear. And so once we move into the realm of God's love, we have no fear of ever being cast out again. Because it's not performance-based. It's based on what God has done, Reformation theology, not on what we do or have done. <laughs> Let me uh, point out a couple of more things. In Romans chapter 8, uh, Paul is addressing this, this very issue. And uh, he says some things here. He says, uh, let me pick this up in verse 33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God. Who indeed is interceding for us. Who, here's a pertinent question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now he starts this laundry list of things. And just listen to these. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Now those are kind of outside things that can happen to us. None of those things can separate us from the love of God. Then go down here uh, to verse 37 and he picks it up again. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am, and here's an important little word, sure, Paul's very emphatic, I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or anything else, just in case he missed something, in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. That's a pretty all-inclusive list. And I've talked to people and they say, well, yes, but we can, we can choose to walk away from God. Well, we can, but we can't walk away from his love. Because after all, we are a created thing, aren't we? Sure we are. And he says nothing in all creation can do that. So God continues to love us because his love is perfect. Now read John chapter 6. You, you've heard me quote those verses a lot. You know, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and of all that come to me, I will lose none. Absolutely not. Because you see, we're saved by grace and we're kept by grace. It's not of ourselves. So uh, another little aspersion that folks like to cast on this theology, I remember my mother used to do it all the time. She'd say, well, those, she was talking about those Baptists. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, she'd say, well, those Baptists just believe you can live any way you want yeah, because you're once saved, always saved. Well, that's not, that's not true because we have the Holy Spirit within us. So yes, you can live any way you want, but you have the Holy Spirit in you who constrains you. And so the, your desires will be towards the Lord. So uh, I, I think those folks have too low a view of the Holy Spirit. I, I know one time I was listening to a message that Alistair Begg was giving right over here at Western Seminary. And uh, he said, the problem with most of us Christians is we don't trust the Holy Spirit. We feel like we have to control other people. Uh, we just leave them alone. The Holy Spirit can do a fine job of taking care of them himself. And I, I, I thought, yeah, Alistair, that's, that's right on. So there you go. You know, it's, it's a good thing that I, I have that because, you know, sometimes I'm not very lovable. <laughs> that's what Karen said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we, and I know that this one's anxiously anticipated by some people here, um, and I and I know why. You know, uh, the question is, do animals go to heaven? Well, and that's a that's a question that, that a lot of people ask, and it's one of those questions that the Bible doesn't give us a definitive answer. There's no place in Scripture where it says all dogs go to heaven. Or, the other side, it, there's no place that it says dogs don't go to heaven. 
or cats or whatever it is we want to talk about. But there are some clues that I think we can look at in Scripture and draw some reasonable assumptions from. And, and you know, there was a time when I would have thought, well, that's a frivolous question. Who cares? Uh, but, you know, we, we love our animals and, and they're important to us. And uh, so it can be a very burning question for some people. So let's look and see what Scripture says. And the first place we're going to look is in Genesis chapter 1. Because the closest thing we have to a glimpse of heaven is creation before the fall. Okay? So what do we find there? In verse 24 of chapter 1, we see this. That God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So in the original creation, we have animals. And we have God declaring that that was good. So that kind of gives us an indication. Well, if there are animals before the fall, and that's the closest thing we have to what heaven might be like, just possibly there are going to be animals in heaven. And then if we go over to uh, Genesis chapter 9, and uh, uh, we're going to see God is making a covenant. And I want you to notice who he makes this covenant with. Now, chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. Now watch this. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. Now... Again, we're, we're drawing some inferences from this, but uh, if God wasn't concerned with the animals, why would he have bothered? Why, why would he not just said, I'm making my covenant with you and your sons and your offspring thereafter? But for whatever reason, he throws this little clue in there for us. And uh, <clears throat> the only thing I remember from the law, law class I took in college was we had, were developing a nexus line now. Uh, this goes to this, to this, to this, and we'll eventually get to, uh, I think, a reasonable conclusion. Another place in Scripture, in Isaiah. Isaiah is talking about when, Jesus, when Christ's reign is realized and everything is made new again. And uh, here's what he says, uh, verse, chapter 11, verses 6 through 9. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the wean child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Now it seems like there's going to be animals and there's no, no, God is going to do away with all animosity, uh, with aggression and all that sort of thing, and they're all going to dwell together. Now just exactly what that's going to look like, I don't know. But again, it seems like we have another clue here that these animals are definitely going to be with us. And uh, uh, again, Isaiah over in, in uh, chapter 65, verse 25, again talks about uh, the wolf and the lamb and the lion and the ox being together. So another little point on our nexus line. Now, we've talked about what we might know. Now let's talk for just a minute about what we know absolutely. We know that heaven will be a place of unimaginable bliss and wonder, don't we? But we've, we're seeing that as we're getting to the end of the book of Revelation. Uh, heaven is going to be a place where God has wiped away all the tears, all the sorrow. Everything is joy and it's wonderful, it's magnificent. Uh, you know, second, or 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 tells us, you know, eye has not seen, ear has not heard. The wonderful things that God has in store for us, i.e., we can't even imagine how marvelous heaven's going to be. So, if our, 
if animals add to our happiness, if they add to our well-being, does it not follow that if we're going to be in this place of perfect happiness, there will be animals? So I would say, now I can't say scripture says, but I would say, just from those things we looked at, that it's a valid conclusion that there will be animals in heaven. <laughs> well, it makes sense. Um, what, you know, in the way you lay it out. Uh, we're coming now to the next question. Uh, what was Paul's thorn in the flesh? Another one of those that I can answer, well, the Bible doesn't say. <laughs> so again, we're going to have to do a little uh, looking uh, to try to determine. So let's read it first here. And uh, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 and following. So this is Paul speaking. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the unsurpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, and that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then you are strong. There's a lot of things packed into this little passage, and, and we could do a, do a whole sermon on it, but we're, we're going to just touch on a few things. Let me, uh, let me give you some of the suggestions that have been made for this thorn in the flesh. Uh, it has been suggested that it was a physical ailment, and it could be. Uh, some have even narrowed it down to it was a, an eye problem that Paul had, and one of the reasons they say that is because he, he used uh, secretaries, if you will, to do his writing. And over in Galatians, when the people were giving him a bad time, he referred them back to a time when they thought he was just really keen, and he said, you, you loved me so much you were willing to pluck your very eyes out for me. So they, they get from that that, well, it was probably an eye ailment, and he was referring to that they would love to see him healed, and, and so on. And could be. I, I don't know. Uh, another suggestion is that it was a mental problem, that this messenger from Satan, uh, like a, a manic depressive type of thing or something, and, and it was just causing him all sorts of problems. Again, it could be. We, d we don't know. And the third suggestion and after being in the ministry for 30 plus years, I tend to lean towards this one. <laughs> but that it was uh, someone or some group that were constantly giving him a bad time, trying to destroy him or destroy his ministry. And if you uh, really read uh, Acts and that, as, as we have done in our group, some, you find out that there were a group of people that literally followed Paul from city to city and tried to disrupt his ministry. And, and cause problems for him. So it could have been any of those things. It could have been a physical illness, a mental illness, or it could have been a group of people. Now, I have a little phrase that I like, and it's called ambiguity by design. And I think we see it in Scripture a lot. I think when God is ambig ambiguous, it isn't because he forgot to include something. It's because he wants to make the application of what he's talking about broader so we can apply it to uh, many different situations in our lives. And I think that's what he's doing here. And I think the real implications from this verse uh, aren't uh, necessarily identifying what this thorn was. But there's much we can learn from this passage. One of the first things we can learn is when we tend to talk about the apostles, I mean, we're talking about giants of the faith, right? I mean, we're talking about guys that are so much more spiritual than us, guys that literally saw, walked with Jesus, that they would never be susceptible to the everyday temptations we are. 
But here's one verse where it says we are. Because Paul, the apostle of the apostles, if you will, and what does he say? God gave me this thing to keep me from being so stinking conceited. And that's a little paraphrase, but that's what it says, isn't it? You see, Paul was just as subject to pride and prideful actions as we are. So God sends this messenger from Satan so he doesn't get too puffed up. Because you remember, uh, he was the rabbi among rabbis. Now he's the apostle among apostles. He, he went to the best school. Uh, he had the best of everything. The, the guy is literally a genius. Jesus Christ himself shows up and knocks him off his horse and talks to him. It'd be pretty easy to get puffed up, wouldn't it? So, if, if Paul is subject to prideful arrogance, then well, we probably need to make sure we don't uh, succumb to that in our lives either. Another thing I think we really see here is how important it is that we submit ourselves to God's will. I think this is where Paul really shines. Because you'll notice now he didn't like this thorn. And he entreats God three times to remove it. And that's the last you ever hear of it. You go on through all the rest of his epistles, never comes up again. You see, I think what Paul was doing, he went to the Lord and he says, Lord, remove this, remove this, remove this. Okay, Lord, this must be your will. I'm going to get on with things. You see? If this is how you want me to live, great. I'm going to continue on and fulfill my ministry to the best of my ability. And, and it's hard for us to do that because we don't like it when things aren't right, physically, mentally, or relationally. It's uncomfortable. And so we, we tend to go back to God and go back to God and go back to God. And I don't know that that's wrong, but we don't see it in the prayers of the apostles. And they tend to go to God and accept whatever God says and move on. And so that's a good, I think it's a good thing for us. So after saying all that, in grand pastoral fashion, we still don't know the answer. <laughs> but I, I think maybe we learned a couple of things. I like that. Um, and you know, it, you, when, you, when you were speaking, you reminded me that, you know, when the groups were following Paul, I mean, they, they plotted to kill him, and they did all kinds of things to him and, and, and followed him from town to town, uh, trying to affect his ministry. So it... Uh, you know, maybe they were the thorn in the flesh. Who knows? You know, you also, one of the other things you said is, you know, some, uh, you, as you were speaking, I'm sitting here thinking, sometimes God's answer is no. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that, you know, I guess, you know, Paul's willing to accept no the first time. I guess some of us have to learn it the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> and isn't that the way it is? It, little children have a hard time taking no for an answer, don't they? Sometimes they throw little fits and temper tantrums. And, but as we mature, we learn that we have to accept no. Now, I know none of you have ever thrown a little temper tantrum about what God <laughs> has said no to. But we can transfer that right over to our spiritual lives. Yeah. You're right on. Mike. So now we're going to come to the next question. Uh, what is baptism in the Spirit, and when does it happen? That's a little more complicated question, but I, we, we can at least come up with a good solid answer for us in that one. Uh, there's, there's really three terms I want to deal with because there are three things uh, that the Holy Spirit does for us. Uh, we're baptized in the Spirit, we're sealed by the Spirit, and we're filled with the Spirit, right? You, you've all heard those terms. And so we, we're kind of going to have to deal with all of them. And fortunately for us, all three of those terms are our good friends we call Greek verbs. And you all remember Greek verbs are our friend. They tell us a lot of things. And the more we're acquainted with them, the more we're able to understand these things. So we're going to look a little bit at these verbs. Now there are, there are two different things here. There's the, there's the filling, and we'll see how that goes. And then the sealing and the baptism. The sealing and the baptism go together. The filling 
is in a totally a separate category. And yes, there we have, a, we have something up there we can go by. And hopefully this will make some sense to you. I'll, I'll try not to get too technical. But when we look at a Greek verb, it's different than an English verb. It's, it's packed full of information for us. Uh, it tells us uh, what kind of action we're looking at it. It tells us uh, whether it's uh, a possibility that this is going to happen or it is uh, a positive this is going to happen. Uh, just a lot of different things. So I, I want to deal with sealing for, well, excuse me, with filling first. Uh, we all know Ephesians 5.18, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Okay, now it is a different type of verb than sealing and baptism are. It is in what we call the indicative mood. And the indicative mood is the mood of command. It's where God says, I want you to do this. Or I don't want you to do that. Okay? Now, it carries with it the, the option for the person being spoken to to either obey or disobey. Okay? So in the indicative mood, the mood of command, it's, it's just like if I uh, tell you to go to the grocery store and get me some milk, you have the volitional choice of doing it or not doing it. Okay? The tense tells us, <coughs> now Greek tense is different than ours. It's not so much concerned with time. It's not past, present, future. Uh, it's, it's concerned with, the, the theological word is Achtenstark. And often start is a German word, which means kind of action. So the tense deals with the kind of, of action here. And so this is continuous action. In other words, it's repeated over and over and over. So God tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit again and again and again and again and again ad infinitum. Okay? And the voice is passive, and the voice tells us who is, who is doing the action. So in the passive voice, the action is being done to you. Okay? So when God says to you, be filled with the Spirit, you have a choice to obey or disobey. Okay? If you obey, you need to obey again and again and again and again. But you have nothing to do with it actually happening. The Holy Spirit provides it for you. Okay. Now, when we come to sealing and baptism, we move into a different mood, and it's, it's the mood of reality. In other words, when he talks about us being sealed or baptized, it's happened. It's reality. We have no part in it. We don't have the option of saying, okay, I want to be sealed, or no, I don't want to be sealed. It's a reality. It's a realized fact, if you will. The same thing with baptism. It's a realized fact, okay? And maybe, maybe I should read in uh, Ephesians tells us that we are sealed. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, I'll read that for us. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And, uh, of course, our baptism verse is from 1 Corinthians 12, 13, where he tells us, by one spirit you were all baptized into one body. Okay. So no, no ambiguity there. Those are realities. If you have uh, placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been sealed and you have been baptized. Now it's up to you to maintain uh, the filling. And the tense now is the aorist tense, which is again just a tense. It just says, boom, this happened. Okay? So that's happened. It's not continuous. It doesn't go on. It happened once. That's good. That's all it needs to. And of course the passive voice again, because it's the Holy Spirit that does the filling. So we're all baptized into one body. Now, the, the Ephesians 1 verse tells us when this happens. And what does it say? In verse 13, it says, In him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed. That's the moment you were sealed. Same thing we have in Pentecost, isn't it? 
And at the end of Peter's sermon, what do we do? All who believe were baptized. Now that was the physical baptism to represent the spiritual baptism. So, when does it happen? At the moment we believe. How long does it last? Forever and ever. And really there's, there's no ambiguity there uh, whatsoever. Well, unfortunately, with the... Uh, oh, you want to do which one? Yeah, we'll do that last one. Just oh. right quick. Oh. Uh, okay. When, when are we allowed to be judgmental and how do we know when we've gone too far? Yes, yeah. we did, in the interest of time. <laughs> well, you've gone too far in being judgmental when you're judging me. <laughs> it's that simple. Now, this thing about not judging it is confused all the time because in reality, in fact, we make judgments all the time. And the Lord tells us to weigh things, to judge things, to consider things. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. We, that's part of life. We have to make judgments. Now, what he tells us not to do is we are not to judge whether another person is a Christian or not a Christian. Because we don't know. Only God knows our hearts. A person can look like he's the most saintly person on earth and not know God at all. And a person can look like they're a total mess and know God. Now, I mean, look at the guy that God says is a man after my own heart. Look at his lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah, he ended up okay, but it took him a long time to get there. And uh, he certainly had some struggles. And I know there are times when we would have looked at, at David's life and said, well, there's no way he can be a Christian. Yeah. So uh, that's what we're not to judge. Now we can judge people's actions yeah, and that sort of thing. But even then, when we're judging their actions, there's a difference between judging their actions and being judgmental. And the difference, I think, is, is uh, found most, most clearly in, in Luke chapter 6, uh, verses 37 through 42. And let me read those for you. It's a familiar piece of scripture. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, and everyone, when his family fully trained, will be like his father. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take out the log of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Now what is all this stuff? Well, I think the log is simply this. The log is a lack of Christian love and charity in your heart, or my heart, if, if I'm the subject to this thing. You see, it's one thing to go to a person, we see something in their life that probably shouldn't be there, that's a hindrance or whatever. You know, it's one thing to go to them and put your arm around them and say, you know, you, you, I see you walking down this road and I don't think it's the best, and you know, I love you, but I'm, and I'm willing to walk down this road with you for a ways, and let's see if we can't work this out. Now, it's another thing to come to that same person and say, what the hell's wrong with you? You know? You, you must not even be saved. Look at you. And Christians do that stuff all the time. Yeah, you see? we do. The difference between judging and being judgmental turns on our heart condition, turns on our motive. 
I, I was so proud of one of my guys in my, my morning class last, last week. We were talking about something, and one of the things these guys are always bemoaning is they're, they're not learning anything because it's too complicated. <laughs> but, but we were talking about something, and he spits out a quote from a, a Roman praetorium you know, from, the, from the first century, and, and it was, see how these Christians love one another. That's what impressed the pagans of their time. And that's what will impress the pagans of our time, too, if they can see how we love one another. Because that's what it's all about. We all make mistakes. And, and that's another reason why I think God lets us make mistakes and sends us these things sometimes to trip us up. Because I know in my life, I am much more gracious and much more compassionate to people that make the same mistakes I have made than people that make the mistakes that I've been able to avoid. So, uh, just remember that. When we deal with people, it's like God dealt with the woman caught in adultery. You know, everybody says stoner. Jesus says, you that is without sin, throw the first stone. See? So, that's briefly the difference between being judgmental and judgmental. And, and by the way, re read Galatians 6. Verses 1 and 2, you know, if any brother is caught in a trespass, come alongside him and help him bear his burden. So, you know, you know I, I, I want to, you know, on behalf of the congregation from both this week and last week, you know, I want to thank you mm -hmm. for opening this up and giving us the opportunity to, to be able to ask you questions. Um, I think this is something that's unique. I, I, I've never seen this in any other church, so it, it's, it's a wonderful experience, and, and, and you learn a lot. Unfortunately, we didn't get to the one question we wanted to, but we're out of time. Uh, so, you know, on behalf of the entire congregation, you know, again, I want to thank you, Pastor. Well, thank you, Mike, and thank you, guys. And again, full disclosure, years and years ago, I don't remember from whom, but I read about this and stole it from somebody. It wasn't my original idea, but uh, I don't remember who to give it credit to, but anyway, thank you guys. You're a great congregation. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word, and, and Lord, thank you that uh, we, aren't, we aren't always able to figure it out. It's almost like you're telling us, have a little faith in you. And so, Lord, we, uh, we cry out to you as the, the man in the New Testament and said, Lord, we believe, help our unbelief. And now, Lord, go with us this day and uh, help us to represent you well. Help us to uh, perhaps put on a display for one another somewhere uh, that will be uh, looked at by someone else and they will just be amazed and want to know why we can do that. We ask these things in your wonderful name, Jesus. Amen.